but with no information and no knowledge. Pictorial evidence, but limited testimony of the people who live there and work the land. My whole series, Celestial Spaces, was about the gaps. Acknowledgement of the capacity for my discipline, photography, to document so much but reveal so little without a narrative. So this is Kyandra. So this paddling pool on the left is what covers this land that I saw and I have never seen another photograph of. So these are paddling pools constructed by the Chinese specifically for searching through the water for gold. This was a particular technique and it was a technique that um, was problematic because it used the water that other people had already looked for the gold and then maybe found some gold. Bit of an issue. So I combined these um, sheds, they're called in archaeology, not shards, sheds, um, from my university has two digs in Kyandra. And so you can see I'm pushing these things together, but of course they don't go. There's a, there's a gap. And this is the specific um, river part where the Chinese were moved from the main town because of racial disharmony in the 1860s. So traversing the land, I found in the cemetery two graves, which really interested me. Catherine Joanna Watts and Toma Yan have adjacent graves. But the small one of Toma Yan is not an official grave. Someone has written on this and placed it there. They have placed it um, alongside her grave, and he would not be buried there because he was Chinese. So someone cared enough and made a homemade marker to make a public statement about their relationship. They had a de facto relationship, and they had um, five children together, and their enduring legacy for me aroused my curiosity about these people and following these people, who had done this, and why it, I knew it then was important. So after having this exhibition and showing it in 2014, and the reason I came to Innovate Heritage in 2014 was because we were writing Australian Research Council grants and we wanted some international collaborators. And so I came looking for anyone who might be interested in being an international collaborator. We wrote um, a grant proposal. Um, I won't go into the details. It didn't get up. It's very difficult to get a visual set of visual projects up in the Australian Research Council. Uh, I won't say any more. So, in March 2021, I contacted Rhonda Stewart, who is the um, great-granddaughter of Toma Yan. She lives in Tumut, two hours' drive from my home, through the mountains and Kyandra, which is now a grim and sad sight, everything burnt by the bushfire in January 2020. Rhonda shared with me the family's stories and histories. So for the first time... I could see the story of one of the Chinese miners. And she had all these photographs and objects, a few of which I will show you. So what's, what's in, so what, what's my interest here? So my interest is about revealing and knowing and pressing about cultural diversity and who Australians are, about who our identity, what our identity is. And one thread of the story that I could see in the objects and the photographs and the family that stood out was unexpected. And I think could be something that could light up a popular audience, a broad Australian audience. And the story was that of Rhonda's grandmother, Margaret Ayan, then Wilson, her married name. 
Maggie Yan. She stood out as the central character in a broader narrative of Australian migration and assimilation. And we're starting with just one of Maggie's achievements, which records an Australian first. Everybody loves a first, like they love a big monument. A first could create a snapshot of triumph and detonate thinking about who constitutes Australian history. Her life drew attention to aspects of Australia's past, encapsulating immigrant themes that hold contemporary resonance about the, about the ethnicities and cultures that are foundational to Australian society. Foundational. A generation with pictorial and textual documentation, the Family Archive, perhaps, I don't know, I'd make a mini audio-visual documentary, I don't know. All of what we're seeing today is my raw material. The end product is to come. But the Yan family show us that the Chinese were not all sojourners residing temporarily in the gold fields. Their descendants established lives in Australia. They are an integral part of Australian history. They endow us with multicultural heritage, not just in the present, drawing attention to unrecognised long-term diversity and their incredible contribution. So the people. Maggie Yan. Uh, Maggie Yan was born in 1878 and died in Tumut in 1972, just short of her 95th birthday. So she's the central character of this story, I'm thinking. She is Australia's first ski champion. Her mother is German and her father was Chinese. I love this. It just gets me every time because we think they're going to be Norwegian or Swedish or just Australian. No, they're Chinese German. I love it. It's fantastic. So when I saw this, I was just like, and we've seen these pictures many times, but no one identifies Maggie Yan in these pictures. She's second from the left. So. Her parents, her mother, Catherine Joanna Watts, was the de facto wife of Tom Yan, and she was born in a tiny village near Heidelberg in Germany. She arrived in Melbourne and then made it to the goldfields. Her father, Thomas R. Yan, Fuk Ying, was born in Canton, and when very young, travelled to the gold rushes of New South Wales. He worked as a packer, breaking in horses and a gold miner before becoming a very respected local shopkeeper in the, in the little town. Tom and Catherine had seven children together. She had two sons already. And, and also, um, uh, Catherine died relatively young at 66. Tom Ayan stayed in Kyandra and to, continued to work there until his death when he was 80. So, Kyandra. There was a first period of Chinese settlement very harsh. The reason I gave you the topography and the weather is this was living under canvas tents, gold mining when it was, it, it's, it snowed and it snowed a lot in those days before climate change and, and global warming. So gold was discovered in 1859 and um, the community of Kyandra were ethnically diverse by the end of the 19th century, so there were Anglo-Celtic, Middle Eastern, Asia, etc., etc., people from Europe. And most of them, if not all, participated in skiing, which was called snowshoeing then, and, um, and was, it, it was a very interesting kind of skiing. Um, I am not a downhill skier, I'm a cross-country skier, uh, but if you know about skiing, they didn't turn. They, the, the skiing they had was they went from the top to the bottom as fast as they could. And anyone who turned was a bit of a sissy, yeah? So that was the kind of skiing they did on these planks that they made. The Chinese miners were all male workers, bought to dig gold in teams. And like Tama Yan, they were sponsored to come to the gold fields. They had to repay their journeys. So the village would raise the money, one bloke would all get it, and they were, they, they were supported to come. First in Kyandra Township, due to the racial tension, they moved to the Chinese camp that I showed you. The Chinese method of mining was unique, as I said. They found gold in the discarded tailings, which caused problems, because those who had already made those tailings happen felt ownership of what they were finding. So there were about 3,000 men on these gold fields, 
and that quickly escalated to triple that number. So there were this massive number of people living in this remote place. No trees, no nothing, but little shanties. But then one, when they stopped finding gold, it, the population completely dropped. And then as the Chinese stayed, the um, portion of the population was much larger. So Tom Yan purchased an allotment away from the Chinese camp where they had been placed in the township. So there were weatherboard buildings and he set up a residence and a shop. So, and during this time, the Chinese um, lived in traditional ways. They had feast days, they celebrated, um, you know, their own um, traditions. And so they created this um, less than subsistence existence. There were also buildings in the town by then. So the story of Maggie Yan's life is emblematic of multiple histories, and it connects to Australians, Australian histories of migration, labour and race. Her parents were immigrants who faced racial prejudice and hardship in the early days of Kyandra. For her, though, there were few barriers to competing. By the time she was born, there was little racial discrimination because of the percentage of Chinese in the population. In a community where Chinese were one third and later most half of the population, her parents, Tom A. Yan and Catherine Watts Yan, displayed the immigrant work ethic necessary to survive in the gold fields after the gold rush. So they managed astutely and they entered the business owning class, becoming shop owners and respected community members. And they sort of epitomise that kind of migrant who forges community, takes opportunities um, for their children, and their children rise kind of through the ranks. So Maggie, as you see, is as now the quite kind of well-to-do daughter of this gold miner. So she was the recipient of a changing economic and social status in Kyandra, and the benefits also of a very tight-knit community. Her granddaughter Rhonda notes, Maggie was always an industrious and active woman, and Tom Ayan, her father, was a cheerful, happy person, well-liked in the community. That's anecdotal. So it, it, it's interesting to me that we are looking at a woman also, and I'm in tumor talking to just her granddaughter. This is not ancient history. This is just quite now. And so the Ayan family lived in the center of the origins of snow skiing. In 1861, the population began snowshoeing, skiing downhill as fast as possible with no turns, during a winter of heavy snowfalls where they couldn't do anything else. And they founded the first ski club in Australia. And some people claim in the world, it's incredible, but um, as early as 1885, the club held races for women and children and naming the winners in these races. And it's believed that the first woman to win that documented downhill skiing champion what was at a Kyandra snowshoe event. And that woman was certainly one of the Yan sisters, and I contend it was Maggie, I'll tell you why. So while the club events, the ski events, are on record, the pictorial and photographic evidence that exists in archive begins much later. Um, to the... The photographic documentary evidence um, starts later. So the first verifiable record of the Snowshoe Club's activities goes back to 1896 when Charles Kerry, who's a very famous Australian photographer, visited Kyandra and he had with him his glass plate camera. So there were many famous Australians who visited Kyandra because it was becoming a place where you could um, go and ski. Um, the annual championships were in full swing with over 100 people present and you can recognise in the photographs the features that there were still a number of Chinese people um, skiing. So in 2011, the Kyandra Snowshoe Club was officially recognised by the International Skiing Federation as having organised the first alpine ski races in the history, in the history of the sport. No one thinks about this with re relationship to Australia. It's like, what? Records indicate that in the summer of 1860, some Norwe Norwegians began manufacturing Norwegian-style snowshoes from mountain ash timber. Mountain ash is a, a 
a beautiful, tall, straight um, mountain tree, gum tree, eucalyptus, growing on the lower mountain slopes. In 1861, these three Norwegians formed the Kyandra Snowshoe Club, later the Kyandra Ski Club, and today the Kyandra Pioneer Ski Club. They still have a club in, in the mountains. <coughs> Chinese skiers proved to be not just enthusiastic participants in this novel sport, but skilled competitors. According to historical records, the Kyandra Snowshoe Club held its first special race for Chinese members in the 1860s. From the late 1880s and the following 20 years, the achievements of Barbara, Margaret, and Mary Yan, daughters of Catherine Watts and Tom Yan, overshadowed those <coughs> of many other women competing in downhill events. The Kuma Express on, in August 1895 describes Maggie Yan as a perfect artist on the shoes. That's her jumping. She married um, Jacob Wilson in 1900. So when she was actually became Australia's first ski champion, she was Maggie Wilson, however. So Mrs. Wilson, the publican's wife. So in 1900, Maggie married uh, Jacoby Wilson. Wilson is not his name. We do not know what his name was. He was um, from uh, Assyria, uh, Lebanon, and we do not know what his family name was. So he called himself Wilson, I guess, to fit in. Who knows? But no one knows what his name was. But she married um, Jacob, Jacoby Wilson, and um, no one can determine the family name. So he was a, um, a Syrian Lebanese migrant who arrived in Australia with two other Lebanese men. He originally wor worked as a hawker who travelled the district and traded goods. Jacob Wilson built a lodging house next to the Kyandra Hotel and he purchased another property and under one roof um, had a store and a butcher shop. He also had an interest in another hotel in between 1915 and 1927. So between 1904 and 1917, Maggie and Jacob had five children, all born in the little tiny receding township of Kyandra. So, in an interview with Lindsay Smith in 1966, um, he's someone that was a precursor to Laura Jane. Laura Jane, Smith, who you know, worked at, at um, ANU. Lindsay uh, did his honours degree well before um, that at ANU, but it was a, um, it sort of set up that whole area of where people like Laura Jane could, could also flourish. Anyway, so... In an interview with Lindsay Smith in 1966, Maggie Yan identified um, with her sister, Barbara or Catherine Kate, as being the first documented Australian lady ski champions. But it is Maggie Yan, Mrs. Wilson, in 1909, who won the Butter Dish Trophy that we see here and the Ladies' Championship four years in succession. And some sources also say she was the champion for seven succeeding years. So I'm calling... Maggie Yan as the first champion. And, um, and it only matters because it's, it's a handle upon which to raise the issue of um, challenging people's perceptions of, of what, what is. So that is her with Jacob and two of their children on the veranda of the hotel. And that is her in the entrance to the hotel. You can see the, the kinds of skis, how they pinch in the ends. And that's them on the veranda of the hotel with some of the children. So I've done this to this photograph because the photograph on the left everybody's seen. It's kind of on postcards in Australia if you want to buy a historic something. Um, no one, no one has ever mentioned the Chinese woman in the background. And there's many of these pictures, yeah? So you get these oldie-worldie, this is the mailman, 
but no one has identified Maggie Yan standing on the hotel veranda. And there's many of these pictures, so that's why I have drawn her out. There she stands, and quite recognizable. And is, there's many of these images, and the Chinese uh, participation in, in community life, mm, it gets a mention with Tom Ah Yan, because he was a shopkeeper. It gets a mention in other places, but it doesn't get a mention in all of these images. It's just glossed over. And the same in the skiing images. You have to go in and you start recognizing, yes, the ethnicities that you can see. So that's in 1903, um, the mailman of Kyandra on skis delivering the mail. And that's a ski group on snow. This is seriously what they skied in. Um, and I, Maggie is second from left, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So the Kyandra guest book, the Kyandra Hotel guest book, is another thing that is owned by the family, and it's, it's, it's an amazing document because um, it's held by the Stuart family, and they showed it to me. It's a large leather book, and there are people who have signed and made comments and compliments. And what's really heartfelt is a comment by an eminent Australian poet called Banjo Patterson. Now, Banjo Patterson is, I, I can't make an analogy, but Banjo Patterson is like the bush poet of Australia, like he's the man, right? So he visited that hotel as well, and his comment in there is about very long comment about the scourge of racism and it's signed by him and he makes these comments about Jacob and Maggie, how spectacular they are in their hospitality and about how we should refute racism, etc. And this is a, a wonderful thing to read from Banjo Patterson in this, in this book. So these are the Yan sisters. Um, Maggie on the left, I would say. So the rise and fall of little town of Kyandra, the two stores of Tom Ah Yan and another Chinese guy, George Ah Chi, form the social and economic center for the remaining Ch Chinese of Kyandra until 1916. In 1916, both um, stores were destroyed by fire. This is very common, all timber buildings. Um, not only a tragedy in terms of the loss of one human life, but it also represented the passing of an era for Kyandra. The last of the early Kyandra Chinese had lost their gathering place in the town. And people describe actually Tom Ayan um, using a, um, you know, an abacus to do his calculations in the store. Tom Ayan stayed in Kyandra with his family and continued to live and work there until his death in October 1925. He was the last of the native-born Chinese people at Kyandra. Um, and there you have um, Maggie, second from left, Jacob on the left in Kyandra in 1920. So in 1916, Maggie and Jacob sold the Kyandra Hotel and they left Kyandra for Tumut, where they started to manage a commercial hotel. Jacob died when he was 87 and 57 and Maggie died in 72. Maggie's granddaughter, Rhonda Stewart, told me a story about showing pictures of Maggie to her cousins. And I think this encapsulates why I want to pursue this little project. When she showed them the photograph of their grandmother, Maggie Yan, they were astonished and they said, but she's Chinese. And Rhonda's response was rapid. She looked at them and said, and so are you. The story has an arc that is visually ripe and relates multidimensional tales carrying resonance for Contemporary Issues of National Identity, Maggie from Kyandra.
a Chinese-German descendant, a woman with a sporting success first, an Australian ski champion. It's part forgotten history through assimilation, but also through highly selective telling. Maggie with her husband Jacob are local identities, and hoteliers in Australia are the local identities. Like it's a very important um, role to have in a community. People are strongly judged by how well they are as people and as hoteliers in Australian communities. Their difference was recognised but also defended, strongly defended. So here I've just began to sketch Maggie's life and I'm considering, because I make exhibitions, I make pictures, but I'm considering how to um, form this life. It's still at, as I said, a very just the ingredients stage. Whether I make an exhibition, probably not, multimedia production, etc. But the Maggie Yan story represents compelling but missing historical narratives that are really important to our authentic concept of nation and in my imagination, perhaps a story for popular consumption, resetting, resetting our assumptions about Australian identity and maintaining our perspectives on diversity, which is so critical right now. Thank you. And that is her death notice, which the family also had. So, me. Uh, I really appreciate Dennis, your presentation. Thank you. Very, very nice. Thank you. Uh, quite moving. See, si. yeah, I started to feel like more. Oh. Uh, it's, it's interesting this uh, uh, operational deconstruction of. Uh, some of the uh, classical concept of modernity, which is, si. such as the concept of a national state, si. and also grounding it in a real, uh, you know, in a real narratives, which are com uh, which which for many years we consider residual to the concept of modernity. Si. So thank you for that. I think it's uh, not far from what Fra Pablo and uh, sorry, Emil presented. Just uh, through heritage, we, we, you, we can use the heritage as a um, conceptual tool to deconstruct some of the, um, you know, uh, class very uh, structured, but uh, uh, sometimes, uh, which sometimes removes important history with the H, with si. the micro H, si. which are um, the, the, the fertile terrain where we uh, grew up. And this is a, I think this is the, the, the moment also historical because uh, now nation state is becoming a game. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yes. Um, absolutely, where I live. And this is quite specific, which surprises me because I am I am not a historian. I have no interest in being a historian. But um, this story, it, it is um, when it, it came to me or when I found it, um, uh, it it's too good. And, and it, it remains quite untheorized for two reasons. One, I'm an emerita professor. I don't have to publish in an academic, and, and I don't wish to, um, um, because I, want, I would prefer that it um, be a more popular story somehow, um, not because, yeah, and, and um, yeah, so those two reasons. One, I don't have to um, highly theorize, but I, I can see where it touches the theory, and, and um, one of my reasons for coming here, apart from rejoining um, such an interesting group of people after this time is also to, it, it, it's extremely, um, inspirational is, is not a word I generally use, but it's mobilizing to be amongst, and, and you can theorize, you can see where the theory slots in, should you wish to use it in that way. 
but you know, I'd rather see it on TV. You know, honestly, um, I'd rather see it on TV, but with a good showrunner, because then they put in the love story, uh, the death scene, you know, whatever. Anyway, but I think because I want lots of Australians to know this, to have to think about who we are, like Rhonda Stewart, who is a very average Australian, lives in a small town, um, probably doesn't have these um, ideas about complete diversity, would probably find some of the new immigrants, mm, yeah, but she can see. And when she says to her cousins, you know, and so are you, she's like nailed it. And yeah, I want this. You know what comes to my mind? Uh, as well, I wrote in the 80s, which was written by a historian, um, Terrence Seldin, and what? Well, uh, in the history of humanity. Oh. Starting every chapter with the story of one person. Oh, that, and that's so interesting. Something like back in uh, uh, saying this story, uh, which is a story, not mm. history, brings us the history considering, for example, the relationship between men and women or whatever it is. See. It was a story, so it was touching you because it was considering when you were starting reading every chapter, it was sorry, which you saw blood and whatever. <coughs> it was not a general statement like a no, battle, si. etc. So si. It would be nice to imagine an intimate history of Australia. Yeah, that's so interesting. Starting in some way, people, trails, stories, and then understand why in that uh, time layer. There was something happening at the different level. Yeah, that's a really good reference. You know, my photographs um, of all kinds, all the exhibitions I have, I never, always untitled. You look, you figure it out, yeah? It's not for me to tell you, yeah? But in this instance, I can see the power of story. Of course, my pictures always carried story, but it was an open, malleable story, whereas now it's really important to drive it home. Yeah, but it's because my, uh, also talking about photographs, normally we are so much used about, that's another cultural convention, the idea of labels. You go uh, uh, in a museum and you watch a painting and there's written something like name, <laughs> See. date, See. oil and canvas, which is something either useless uh, or you already know it. See. So it would be nice to say some story, even two sentences, this could be much more eloquent See. for the viewer. See, yeah. So I'm, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you.